This is a presentation to a general audience of evidence for the Bible, since this question comes up all the time in many conversations and people assume that the Bible is strictly held by faith and not evidence, but that's not the case. As I've got here, I'm going to just mainly go through this uh, document and we'll chase down some links in it, but the um, link will be in the description for this document so you can chase them down yourself later if you want. Not all evidence is scientific. For example, we consider certain world figures to be criminals, but on what basis? Paper trails, money spent, character, associations, and so forth. The kind of evidence presented in a court of law. And that's the kind of evidence that supports the Bible. We have to understand the difference between those different, the scientific evidence and forensic or legal evidence. Now, it should also be pointed out that the Bible does not violate any known proved valid scientific laws in its presentation of creation. Of course, miracles by definition do violate those laws, but if such events are confirmed by reliable witnesses, we can't just dismiss them with the wave of a hand. As Sherlock Holmes put it, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And that you can chase down this quote if you want, uh, the sign of the four, chapter six, 1890, and then they have another a reference to a book. But the Bible is not a scientifically falsifiable book. You can do that to individual uh, text material or, you know, analyze the high handwriting and things like that. But as a whole, you don't use the scientific method on the Bible. You can do it, as I said, on the materials and so forth, and you can check history for extra biblical evidence, but that is not scientific evidence. So, but as we'll see, no other text can present more support than the Bible has when it comes to both internal and external manuscript evidence. So now let's look at some of that evidence. This is from Ron Rhodes, a well-known scholar. I don't know if he's still living or not, but uh, this is a summary. We have to understand this is just a summary and if you want all the details, you're going to wind up in .edu websites at the best, and those are linked from my main document that I'll present here in a minute. But we have more than 25,000 partial and complete manuscript copies of the New Testament alone. They're very ancient, available in, for inspection right now. You can go look at them online or at a university. Uh, there are some 36,000 quotations from the early church fathers, several thousand lectionaries. Um, the bottom line in the New Testament has an overwhelming amount of evidence supporting its reliability. This is legal forensic evidence. And the documents exist in reality so they can be scientifically examined for you know, as the best as anyone can determine the date of writing, or at least approximately, they can look at what kind of material, what kind of ink, the style of writing, the alphabet, the language, etc. So it's a mix of evidences, but primarily when it comes to this is the word of God, we're going to go with forensic evidence. As for variants in the text that we have, the extant manuscripts, that is to say the earliest from the time of the original writing, in the many thousands of manuscript copies we possess of the New Testament, scholars have discovered that there are 200,000 variants. This may seem like a staggering figure to the uninformed mind, but those, to those who study the issue, the numbers are not so damning as it may initially appear. In fact, indeed, look, a look at the hard evidence shows that the New Testament manuscripts are amazingly accurate and trustworthy. To begin, we must emphasize that out of these 150,000 variants, 99% hold virtually no significance whatsoever. Many are, involve a missing letter in a word, some involving reversing the order of two words, such as Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. Uh, absence, some have absence of significant words. But when you put that all together, only about 50 of the variants have any real significance. And even then, no doctrine of the Christian faith or any moral command is affected by them. That should be a affected, not affected. A little spelling error there, but uh, for more than 99% of this case, the cases, the original text can be reconstructed to a practical certainty. This is called textual criticism. It is applied to all documents across the board in a scholarly study. There's nothing that they leave out or add to for doing this to the Bible. So even in the few cases where some 
perplexity remains, this does not impinge on the meaning of Scripture to the point of clouding a tenet of the faith or a mandate of life. Thus, in the Bible, we have, as we have it, uh, we do have, for practical purposes, the very word of God, inasmuch as the manuscripts do convey to us the complete vital truth of the originals. And as I've pointed out in studies on the King James Bible, the preface itself says, from the translators to the reader, says that even the, the lowest quality translation of the Bible is still the word of God and should be considered such. That's what the King James translators said, and that was their opinion and their attitude toward translation in general. They were very level-headed people when it came to that, but not so much those who idolized that version. Anyway, side issue. By practicing the science of sex textual criticism, comparing all the available manuscripts with each other, we can come to an assurance regarding what the original document must have said. Again, this is not something special we do for the Bible. It's for all the same techniques for all ancient documents. So as they give an example here that they have five different manuscripts and each one has a problem. And they, they ask you to look at these and see if you can figure out what the original said from these five different manuscripts. And it's pretty obvious that you can, even though there's something wrong with each one of them. So could you, by comparing, ascertain what the original document said with a high degree of certainty? Yes, you could. It's simplistic, but a great majority of the 150,000 variants are solved by this method that you just used yourself on these sentences. That's the kind of discrepancies we're talking about for the most part. And as they mentioned, there's only about 50 truly problematic areas. And in that many words in the Bible, that's phenomenal. That's very, very accurate. Most manuscript variations concern matters of spelling, word order, tenses, and the like. No single doctrine is affected by them in any way. We must also emphasize that the sheer volume of manuscripts we possess greatly narrows the margin of doubt regarding what the original document said because we've got way more than five. We have thousands to work with, which is unprecedented compared to other documents, and which they're going to get to next. So, by comparing the manuscript support for the Bible with support for other ancient documents and books, it's overwhelmingly clear that no other ancient piece of literature can stand up to the Bible. Manuscript support for the Bible is unparalleled. There are more New Testament manuscripts copied with greater accuracy and earlier dating than for any secular classic from antiquity. The historical books of antiquity have a documentation inf infinitely less solid. If we compare the present state of the text of the New Testament with that of no matter what other ancient book you may choose, we must declare it marvelously exact. Uh, Norman Geisler, another known scholar, um, makes, uh, you know, I don't agree with all of his theology, but when it comes to Greek scholarship, that's what he's an expert in. His observations on these bullet points, no other book is even a close second to the Bible on either the number or early dating of the copies. The average secular work from antiquity survives on, on only a handful of manuscripts. The New Testament has thousands. The average gap between the original composition and the earliest copy is over a thousand years for other books. The New Testament, however, has a fragment within one generation from its original composition, which some cite some scholars say may in fact be original writings. We have whole books within about 100 years from the time of the autograph, the original manuscript, most of the New Testament in less than 200 years, and the entire New Testament within 250 years from the date of its completion. The degree of accuracy of the copies is greater for the New Testament than for other books that can be compared. Most books do not survive with enough manuscripts that make comparison even possible. And from this documentary evidence, it's clear that the New Testament writings are superior to comparable ancient writings. The records in the New Testament are vastly more abundant, clearly more ancient, and considerably more accurate in their text. So this is nothing to brush aside. If you believe in evidence at all and understand the difference between scientific evidence and forensic evidence and textual criticism as a science so-called in itself, then these are unassailable facts. We also have, as mentioned earlier, that these church fathers, so-called, these early theologians, quoted the Bible, especially the New Testament, so many times you could reconstruct it just from that. 86,000 quotations. And there are many thousands more of these things called lectionaries, which are worship books. They all quote scriptures. You could put it together just from that. 
So even if we didn't have a single copy of the Bible, scholars could still reconstruct all but 11 verses of the entire New Testament from material written within 150 to 200 years from the time of Christ. That is phenomenal. Now they get into the Old Testament. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove the accuracy of the transmission of the Bible. In fact, these scrolls discovered at Qumran in 1947. We have Old Testament manuscripts that date about a thousand years earlier than the other Old Testament manuscripts that we had before. So from 900 AD, it went to 150 BC. That's the gap that the Dead Sea Scrolls covered. And the significant thing they go on here is to one compares the two sets of manuscripts, it's clear that they are essentially the same with very few changes over that much time is phenomenal. So the fact that manuscripts separated by a thousand years are essentially the same indicates the credible accuracy of the Old Testament's manuscript transmission. That is to say the care with which it was copied. So no telephone game problem is going on here. A full copy of the book of Isaiah was discovered at Qumran, even though the two copies of Isaiah discovered in Cave 1 were a thousand years earlier than the oldest dated manuscript previously known. They proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible and more than 95% of the text. And the rest, the other 5%, slips of the pen, that is to say typos, and spelling differences. So we have undeniable evidence that today's Old Testament scripture, not, you know, we've already gone over the New Testament, for all practical purposes, the Old Testament is exactly the same as it was when originally inspired by God and recorded in the Bible. Combined with a massive amount of manuscript evidence for the New Testament, it's clear that the Christian Bible is a trustworthy and reliable book. God's preservation. This is another issue in Bible versions of debate. How did, are we saying God didn't preserve his word if, if we say that the King James isn't the Bible? But as I've gone over in other, other videos, there's nothing in the King James to say this must be the one that God chose, for one thing. For another thing, there's nothing in the Bible that says God chooses a perfect Bible in each language, in each generation. And for another thing, this volume of evidence that we have is the best support. That's how God's preserved his words. The problem only comes in translations. Yes, there are squabbles over Greek text families for the New Testament. But as already stated, these differences in the text families are not significant. There are so-called missing verses or added verses, depending on who you ask. And I've gone over those in another video, so I won't be doing that here. But the respect, going down here to the last paragraph, the respect that Jesus and his apostles held for the extant Old Testament text is, at base, an expression of the confidence in God's providential preservation of the copies and translations as substantially identical with the inspired originals. Hence, the Bible itself indicates that copies can faithfully reflect the original text and therefore function authoritatively, and that's the big deal. Why is it important that the Bible is supportable with evidence? Because it carries the authority of God himself, because it is inspired by God. So, the evidence is very, very important, and it's very, very good for the Bible. So, now let's go back to uh, this one. And on the part about, uh, there was a part in the original document I had, it disappeared in between the time I wrote this up and the time I went to do this presentation. But there was a part in it about measuring layers of ink on these ancient documents. That's how meticulous this, this gets. They measure layers of inks written down over and over on a, they, they would reuse these uh, papers, but you know, made of papyrus or whatever it was, animal skins. They would reuse it, would scratch out the old text and write on top of it. Well, with modern methods, you can peel away those layers and get to the originals. So ask yourself, who goes to this much effort to examine a document? Who puts any other writings to such extreme tests? When people say they've dug up the Gospel of Thomas or Barnabas or something like that, and they say, this is the truth, the Bible is wrong, have they done this level of testing on those documents? I don't think they have. And certainly the most of the people who wave them in the air and say this disproves the Bible or should supersede it, don't even know if such tests have been done, let alone whether they have and whether they're familiar with the methods and who did them and whether it was duplicated. So their standards that they demand of the Bible 
are extremely much higher than anything they demand of their own claimed evidence, if they demand anything at all, rather than blindly swallow it. Now, I have this document, this To the Point, the Bible, on my own website, which is where a lot of these links are from, not all of them. But this is my collection of Bible evidence, and not just evidence for the manuscripts. We also have what was decided to be in the Bible, contradictions and reliability, um, inerrancy, alleged pagan roots of Christianity, tampering, alleged evil teachings, and, of course, extra-biblical evidence, and then a section on Bible versions and translations. So this is the one-stop quote quote mining, if you want to call that, but it isn't quote mining unless you're taking things out of context, and this is all backed up, all cited, all referenced. So that's why it's not quote mining or cherry picking. And you'll notice there, if you look at those links, that several of them are to refutation of claims that Christianity plagiarized or adopted earlier pagan beliefs. So the Bible is, at the very least, much more supported by objective evidence than any other ancient text, as we've seen. It's quite ironic, as I just mentioned before, when critics try to cite older documents to debunk it, and they uncritically accept those documents as true and accurate. So, whatever test you want the Bible to meet, you must make your debunking documents meet. As for internal evidence, that page that I just referenced, my To the Point page, includes a link to a document called The Testimony of the Evangelist by Simon Greenleaf, who was a founder of the Harvard School of Law, who cross-examined the four gospel writers and found them credible witnesses. And this is how you would determine any guilt or innocence in a court of law. You have to cross-examine witnesses. And this is, uh, there are similar examinations of other writers in the New Testament books, and they are reliable people as well. These are not just, these are not people of poor reputation. These are not liars. These are not people they just did, made up. So here are some sources. Again, you can uh, go to this document and click on these and chase these down. Some of them are very long. But they attest to, and then the Bible says, by the testimony of two or three witnesses, think, uh, uh, the truth of a matter will be established. So we have at least three sources here on authenticity and trustworthiness. So if you really, truly want to know what backs up the Bible and whether the, it was written by, down by credible people, this is the sort of work you will do. And I've provided at least some links to get you started. As for the Old Testament, these reliable New Testament writers, and Jesus, of course, quoted often from it as true and accurate, in spite of the fact that they were quoting the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX, which is the Roman numerals for 70, and that's what Septuagint means, the 70, although there may have been 72. This is the early translation of scripture into Greek from the earlier Paleo-Hebrew. So you can also look at more of that sort of thing uh, from my posts on the To the Point the Bible under the earliest manuscripts. So there's the link there conveniently for you if you want. And the thing is that the Paleo-Hebrew is not at all like the square script we're familiar with with Hebrew, which is more uh, Aramaic in its form. Uh, the original Paleo-Hebrew did not have vowels in it, and, and vowel pointing was added later to the newer Hebrew script. And in pointing the vowels, they could actually change the meanings of words, and that they did in many cases, especially, it seems, regarding the uh, Messianic prophecies, because the early Christians were using the Septuagint to prove that Jesus did fulfill all the prophecies. If you ask rabbis today whether Jesus fulfilled them, they'll point you to their own vowel-pointed, twisted text, the Masoretic, and tell you that, no, he didn't. And you consider them authorities because they're rabbis and they're Jews and this is their stuff. But these were Jews with an agenda. They killed their own Messiah in the first century. And as one person put it, I think it was Aaron, uh, Eric Von Daniken, not Eric Von Daniken, uh, William Denkenbring. Sorry, I've got my conspiratorial names mixed up there. But William Denkenbring uh, pointed out that this is the, the same group of people who would literally physically murder their own Messiah, wouldn't stop at mangling the written word of God. I have seen um, video presentations by modern Pharisees. There are actually Pharisees today 
where they explain the mindset, which is that once God gave them the Bible, their, their Torah, their Tanakh, then it was theirs to do with that they chose, and not even God could contradict them after that point. That's the Pharisee mindset admitted by them. I don't have a direct quote for that because the video has disappeared, but it was a documentary by an actual, a lecture actually, by an actual Pharisee. So, be careful who you ask about these things because they have a vested interest in despising Jesus as Messiah. They believe he did not, that he was a false Messiah and an imposter. So, Jesus and the New Testament writers quoted the Greek Septuagint not the Masoretic text, which is the name ad uh, adopted by those who used to be called Talmudists. They are the people who um, created that oral tradition and then wrote it down eventually in time that this was the traditions that Jesus had a problem with, that the, the Pharisees and scribes were pushing on people in the first century. So you can look again at uh, the earliest manuscripts in the to the point document we have all of that listed here they can you can chase down these links if you're really serious about finding out the evidence now of course the critics claim the Bible is full of internal contradictions as well but examining each instance presents a different picture in my Bible post under contradictions and reliability which you can see here um, You'll see a link to a site that debunks every claim by the skeptic's annotated Bible. Standard disclaimer applies means that I don't necessarily agree with the solutions in every case, but the, the point is that just as for whatever mental reason that any unbeliever would go through the entire Bible and just try to find contradictions, someone else has decided to challenge those claims even though they're extensive. And that's what is provided there in that document. So the majority of claims come from ignorance and failure to consider each context. If you do some spot checking on the skeptic's annotated Bible and then the debunker of it, you will find that there's not as anywhere near as many even possible contradictions as they claim. So this is the one debunking the skeptic's annotated Bible. I haven't checked to see if all of these links are still live, so if there isn't, just let me know. Um, but as for alignment with secular history, the evidence presented so far leaves little doubt that without references to the supernatural, no one would question the Bible's accuracy or trustworthiness as a historical document. And that indicates in philosophical bias because people are, are presupposing that miracles are impossible, therefore any document that contains miracles must be dismissed. But that's a fallacious argument. The Bible is an accurate, highly examined text to a degree no other is, is demanded. And the, the writers of it are quality people from what anyone can tell. And because of that, they are to be believed. And you wouldn't want people of this reputation to be dismissed if they were defending you in a court of law. So. Consider this article also linked from my To The Point document, Did Jesus Exist? Searching for Evidence Beyond the Bible. So let's just uh, chase this one down real quick. Because these things do exist. Yes, this is Biblical Archaeology Society, but their vested interest is in finding truth, just as anyone who claims to be a skeptic would say. So among people seeking truth, we can throw bias at, at, at either side. But the fact is that there is evidence for Jesus' existence. You can even find in secular literature, such as the vaunted Wikipedia, that admits that the great scholarly consensus is that Jesus existed, that he was baptized by John the Baptist and sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate. But again, you can check out that document if you really seriously want to know the truth. So we have another one from history.com that you can check, that this is not a Christian source. The Bible says Jesus was real. What other proof exists? Um, so, you know, and then people will attack the historians and, and, and historians, and Josephus is certainly not the only one. 
So, because that's who they always say, well, Josephus wasn't reliable. Well, he was actually not a bad historian. No, nobody's perfect, not even modern historians, but we don't all throw them out just because they say a couple of things that are out of line. That's what cross-checking does. That's how you find out. So, these are primarily about historical evidence for Jesus, but the first one, Did Jesus Exist?, includes a link from, for an earlier document on people named in the Old Testament. So you can chase that down. There's many layers of links you can chase down. I'm just presenting them to you so you can do your homework. So on what basis does anyone reject the Bible as a historical source in its own right? We need to turn a critical eye to secular history just as well. Consider this video that I got linked here. I won't take the time to show right now which also presents very interesting evidence that there was tampering with the ages of some of the people before the flood in the Bible. And I've mentioned this in other videos about uh, the Masoretic text versus original Paleo-Hebrew. And the these are timelines that I've made as well based on the evidence of those things. You can see one of them here. Um, the, most timelines for the Old Testament based on the Masoretic text are much more squished than this because they've shortened these ages by a hundred years each in many cases. So you can look up there. There's another one from Abraham to Moses, but dates for people and events from Abraham forward are easier to establish, though we have to remember that precise dates by our standards wouldn't be the norm until much later. And to the charge that the Bible as history is unreliable because of alleged bias, that charge, as I mentioned, can be made more easily against the Bible's critics. For example, in this document, we see quotes from Sir William Ramsey, who was quite convinced that the Bible was unreliable until he did his own investigation rather than relying on what his professors and colleagues had told him about the Bible. He grew up and went to college believing what his professors told him, that the Bible was just fabrication. It was pure fiction. It was unreliable. This guy had a bias against it. I hate these pop-ups. Um, but he was honest actually seeking truth and concluded that the Bible is in fact reliable historical evidence. So conspiracy theorists pride ourselves on doing our own studies rather than trusting authorities, but we aren't always consistent with that claim depending on what deep personal prejudices we may hold while criticizing quote unquote normies for the same thing. If we're going to be skeptics, we should at least be consistent and have standards by which we can discern between true and false, including admitting that we can't always tell. There are a lot of people who will decide guilt or innocence on the basis of nothing but suspicion and gossip. So if you're going to be a critic about the Bible, be a consistent critic. Be an informed critic. Don't just blindly accept any document you find, whether it's the Bible or something against the Bible. Investigate everything. Test the testers. And of course, we can't leave this topic, and I'm going to close some tabs here, without a look at this amazing guy, Robert Wilson. So let's check this out, and there are several articles I have here on him. Um, was born in 1856, graduated from Princeton at the age of 20. He went on to earn both a master's and a PhD. He did further postgrad work in Germany for two years, was a brilliant language student. When he was still in college, he could read his New Testament in nine languages while he was still in college. He was 25 when he determined he would invest years of careful study in the text of the Old Testament. Again, who does this for other documents? so that he could speak with authority as to whether or not it has been preserved in an accurate format. The body of Old Testament literature, and again, his emphasis was the Old Testament, was completed by 400 BC, and yet prior to 1946, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the oldest copy of the Old Testament scriptures we possess dated to about the 10th century AD, as we mentioned before. There, so there was a gap of, 12, of almost really 1,200 years between the last Old Testament books and the extant manuscripts. So... He was very disciplined in going, setting about this task of determining with the information he had at the time whether the Bible was reliable, and since and then after that time it was uh, verified by the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
So, based on the longevity of his immediate ancestors, Robert Wilson estimated he might live to about 75 years of age. Since he was 25 at the time, that would give him about 45 years to accomplish his goal. Accordingly, he divided his projected remaining years into three periods of 15 years each. And this was his plan. For the first 15, he would study every language that had a bearing on the text of the Old Testament. He set himself to the tax. During that time, he mastered 45 languages. And some of those were dialects, but still, 45 that he mastered. He became an expert in Hebrew and its kindred tongues. He also learned the languages into which the scriptures had been translated down to the year A.D. 600. He spent 15 years doing that. 45 languages, not including the nine he could read the New Testament in. During the second 15 years, he dedicated himself to studying the text of the Old Testament itself. He looked at every consonant in the Old Testament text. The Hebrew Old Testament has no vowels, as I mentioned, about one and a quarter million of them. This is in the 1800s. No computers. He made a thorough scientific investigation of the Old Testament text as compared with other writings of antiquity. He noted that there are 29 ancient pagan kings of various nations which are mentioned in the Bible. Their names are also found in the writings of their own lands, of course. The names of these kings consisted of 195 consonants. He discovered that in the Old Testament there were only two or three letters of the entire 195 that are in question as to spelling. By way of contrast, in the secular literature of the same period, the names of those rulers frequently are so garbled that one can scarcely identify the person. For example, Ptolemy, an ancient writer, drew up a list of 18 Babylonian kings, and not one of them is spelled right. The text of the Bible was amazingly precise. Wilson spent his remaining 15 years writing down the results of his long research. He authored a marvelous book, A Scientific Investigation of the Old Testament, in which he confidently affirmed we are scientifically certain that we have substantially the same Old Testament text that was in possession of Christ and the Apostles, and so far as anybody knows, the same as that written by the original composers of the Old Testament documents. It doesn't get better than that. And no one who is a critic of the Bible can present evidence to the contrary, let alone better evidence. In fact, as Wilson himself said, anybody who wanted to try to debate him on his research had to use his own original research to do it because he was the expert on all of those languages. Can you name another religion or another secular pursuit that has people like that doing their life work on one thing to that much dedication? And as I mentioned earlier, measuring layers of ink. Yes, it is done on occasion on some other documents, but this is the Bible against its critics, and its critics cannot muster any evidence that even comes close to this. And why is it that people pick so hard on the Bible, and not the Koran, not the Book of Mormon, not the Hindu Vedas? Why is that? People used to say, well, it's because we're in the Western world and we're all familiar with Christianity, and so the Bible is we pick on, because that's the religion we know. That doesn't hold water anymore. It hasn't held water for quite a long time, especially in the age of the Internet, but certainly since the time of the printing press back in the 1500s. So, there are no excuses. The fact is that nobody picks on any document the way they pick on the Bible, and yet the Bible has withstood all, all attacks. As it's been said in history, the Bible, and especially the Christian faith, is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. People keep hammering on it, but it keeps surviving, and in fact it keeps getting better because we keep making discoveries which only serve to support the Bible. It used to be said that the Hittites, for example, were mythical, that they were only found in the Bible, no place else, and therefore the Bible was myth. Well, now you can go to university and study the Hittite language, and culture and artifacts you can see in their museums. The same with the city of Jericho and many others. Every time somebody says this person or place or event never happened, it was only in the Bible, lo and behold, somebody digs up something that proves that the Bible was right once again. That's been the long history of criticism of the Bible, and so my advice would be to any critic of the Bible is, if you don't want to become a Christian, then don't try to critique the Bible.